Now, in this lecture, we would be first looking at some more additional features of the language Perl. Then we shall see how we can use Perl to write or develop CGI scripts with the help of some examples. So, first let us see about something which is called associative arrays in Perl. Now, we have already seen or we have already talked about the conventional or normal arrays or lists. An array is just a collection of list items which can be accessed element wise. Now, you have seen that an array is basically a collection of items which can be accessed by specifying the index of an item in the list. The index starts with 0, so I can say the array number z, uh, array element number 0, element number 1, element number 2 and so on. Now, as the name associative implies, associative means we are trying to access by content. If you recall what an associative memory is, an associative memory is something which you do not access by specifying an address, rather you specify the contents and try to search whether there is any memory location with that content present. So, an associative array conceptually is very similar. It is an array where the primary mode of accessing is by specifying the value of an element rather than the index of the element in the array. Okay. So, associative arrays. Now, in the terminology of Perl, this is also known as hash list or simple hash. Now, an associative array to start with looks very similar to the list. Similar to the list in the sense that it consists of a sequence of elements arranged as a list, but the elements in the list has a very specific ordering relationship maintained among them. How? Here every list element of a hash or associative array consists of a pair of sub elements. The pair, the first element of the pair is called the hash key and the second element of the pair consists of a value. So, if you look at the contents of such a list, you will see that you have a hash key, a value, a hash key, a value in this way it continues. So, hash key value pair appears one after the other. So, that is why the pair hash key and value is considered to be one element of an associative array or associative list. Now, the constraint here is that among all the elements you have in this hash or associative array, the hash key values must be unique. For example, you have a list consisting of the roll number and the names of the students in a class. So, you have roll number name, roll number name in this way. The constraint is that the roll number has to be unique. The reason for this constraint is uh, fairly obvious because we are we are trying to search by specifying the value. There should not be two entries in the list containing the same value of the roll number. That is why roll number has to be unique. So, as I said, the characteristic of associative array is that when you are accessing an element, unlike an array, the element value can be searched by specifying the value of the hash key. Associative search means searching is done implicitly on all the elements of the array. So, you need not have to write a loop kind of a structure in a program where you are searching the list one element at a time. You give a single command, you can search the whole array and find out where a match is found. Now, just to indicate that it is an hash array, the name of an hash array must begin with a percentage sign. Okay. Now, let us see how we can specify the values in a hash array. Now, I had said that the basic element structure of an hash array consists of a hash key and a corresponding value in proper sequence. This example gives you one way of specifying the initial value of an hash array. 
this variable name starting with a percentage indicates that it is a hash array. This opening bracket and this closing bracket indicates the boundary. Now, within this boundary, we are specifying a set of values separated by commas. Okay. Now, in a hash array, as I said, that the values will be appearing in pairs. So, conceptually, these will be the pairs. So, actually, the interpretation of this example is that the first element of the pair is a name and the second element may be a telephone number. So, actually we are trying to store the names of certain persons and the telephone number. Since they logically appear in pairs, a set of such name and telephone number pairs will be stored as an associative array. So, this is the first way of specifying it, where you simply separate out all the elements separated by commas as if it is a normal list, but the associative array will be taking the numbers as pairs where the first elements of the pair that means the name will be taken as the hash key hash key and the second element the telephone number will be taken as the value okay so name is the hash key value is the telephone number the second way of specifying it is like this using the equal and greater than operator here it is quite similar, but you see that the way you specify is a little more meaningful or little more easier to understand. We specify it like this. First, we specify the name as usual, then the symbol equal to greater than, then the telephone number, then a comma. Now, in this notation, when you are using the equal to greater than operator, whatever appears on the left hand side of it, for example, here Rabi it is implied that whatever is in the left hand side is enclosed within a double quoted string. So, the double quoted string here is optional. So, whatever appears to the left of equal to greater than is considered to be a string within double quotes. So, this is a more natural way of specifying it is much easier to understand that well this particular name is associated with this particular value. In the previous case everything was separated by commas. So, unless you separate out the pairs across lines, it may be difficult for you to find out the exact correspondence which is the key and which is the value. Okay. So, this is the alternate way of specifying the initial value of a hash, of a hash or an associative array. Now, here we see how a normal array containing some values can be stored in a hash array or can be converted to a hash. So, let us take an example. First, here we see a case where you have a normal array called list, which consists of the values Ravi, some num telephone number, Chandan, some number and so on. So, actually names and the telephone numbers appear in sequence, but it, but it is a normal array. However, if you make an assignment like this, that this array list is to be assigned to, to a hash array directory, then the pairs are automatically extracted out. Okay. These pairs are automatically extracted out and the first values of these pairs become the hash key and the second value of the pair becomes the hash key value. Okay. Similarly, if you use the reverse kind of an assignment, then whatever is present in a hash array will be assigned to a normal array, where the elements will be appearing in order. So, a normal array can be assigned to a hash array, a hash array can be assigned to a normal array, but essentially the values are the same in the two arrays. So, so what is the difference? The main difference is the way in which you can access the elements. As you know in a normal array, we, we access the elements by specifying the index, but in an associative array as we will see, we can access the element by specifying the value of the hash key. Okay. So, for accessing a hash element in an array, you will have to specify the hash key and we use this symbol curly bracket to indicate that well here we have the given hash key. 
Well, an example is given here. The first line shows you the definition of a list where the names and the telephone numbers are appearing as pairs. Then you are assigning that array to a hash array directory. Then there is a print statement. It says Atul's number is well you look at this part dollar directory directory is the name of an hash array okay whenever we specify dollar directory it means we are trying to access a particular element of that hash array and after dollar directory within curly bracket as you can see within curly bracket we are specifying a value of a hash cube. So, in this case Atul is the is the hash key value and the corresponding value which is this, this will be returned by this directory Atul access to the hash array. So, here what I am saying is that you are accessing as if an element of an array but instead of specifying the index, you are specifying the name of the hash key Atul. In return what it gives you is the name of the value which in this case is the telephone number. So, what will be printed here is Atul's number is 445287, this is what will be printed. Okay. You can modify the value of an hash array by using simple assignments like this. Well, similarly you can say the same example we are assigning these values to a hash array directory. The first example shows you that how we can assign a particular value to a value part of a directory that means we are trying to change the telephone number of Shruti. So, initially the telephone number was 237221. So, after this assignment the telephone number will get changed to this particular value right. The second example shows that we can use the plus plus operator for example, or even you can use it in a normal arithmetic expression to update the values. For example, dollar directory Chandan will mean whatever was the telephone number of Chandan this one, this will get incremented by 1. So, the number will become 325130. Okay. So, this is how you can modify the value part of the hash key and value pair in an associative array, but in all these cases you are accessing the elements by specifying the value of the hash key and in return you are being able to access the corresponding value of the data. Well, you can also delete an entire entry from the hash table, entire entry means the hash key and value pair. This pair can be deleted by using a function called delete. Now, here again whenever you are deleting you will have to specify the value of the hash key. So, the same example if you give a command like this delete dollar directory Atul which means this Atul as well as the corresponding telephone number both will get deleted from this list. Okay. So, using the delete command you can remove a pair of key values means uh, the hash key and values from the associative array totally. Okay. Sometimes we need to swap the keys and values of an array. Well, why it is required? If we come to the same example, see in the example we have given, we are storing the names and the telephone numbers like they appeared in a telephone directory. Normally, people search a telephone directory by name, that was our assumption. The name was chosen as the hash key. So, if we specify the name, we get back the telephone number. But suppose I want to search in the reverse direction. I know a telephone number, I have found out a telephone number, I want to know who is the owner of that telephone, okay. I want to find out the name. But in an associative array, we, we are not allowed to do this kind of a search. Given the value part, 
I cannot find out the hash key part. Okay. So, in a normal hash array you are not allowed to do this kind of reverse searching, but some application may require you to do this kind of reverse searching. So, in that case what do you do? What you do is very simple you reverse the role of the hash key and the values. You tell somehow that will whatever was value earlier this will now become the hash key and whatever was the hash key earlier this will become the value now. Okay. So, well in this example we want to search for a person given the phone number the way you do is, is like this up to this it is exactly as in the previous example the hash array directory contains the name telephone number pairs of the lists. There is a function called reverse in this line we are applying this reverse on this hash array directory. What this reverse will do? It will reverse the roles of the pairs, that means it will reverse each pair. The second element will become the first element, the first element will become the second element of the pair. Okay. So, now the telephone number will become the hash key and name will become the value. So, after this, if you assign it to another hash array, let us call it rev dir, then we can use this ref dir to access by specifying the telephone number. Like if you give ref dir 237221, then we will get back Shruti as the name. So, here what will be printed will be Shruti. Okay. So, this is how we can reverse the roles of the hash key and values. There are some functions which are called keys and values which are also used in a hash array quite frequently. The keys function return all the hash key values as a list. Similarly, the values will return all the value parts of the pair. Like in the previous example, maybe I have an application where I want to list all the names of the persons or I want to list all the telephone numbers that are stored. So, here we need to use the function keys or values. So, an example illustrates the usage the same array I have taken as an example. In this line we have used the function keys, keys is applied to the hash array directory. Keys directory actually will give you a list which will consist of Ravi, Chandan, Atul and Sruti. So, this four element list will be assigned to an array all names and if we use the function values on the same array you will get back the values or the telephone numbers. So, now these four telephone numbers will form a list and it will be assigned to another array called all phones. Okay. So, you can see that how by using the keys and the values functions we can extract the first or the key, key part and the second or the value part of the key value pair in a hash array. Now, a very simple example to illustrate its usage like I want to list all the names of the persons and their corresponding telephone numbers. So, first I have this list I assign it to a hash array directory. Here we use a for each loop you see for each name keys directory. So, keys directory will be returning a list containing all the names Ravi Chandan Atul Shruti. So, this will be a for loop and in this for loop this variable name will be taking one of these names at a time and it will be looping four times and in every loop what it will print? It will print the value of the present name. So, in the first line it will print Ravi, reverse slash t means tab it will give some gap and directory within bracket name. It is a normal hash array access it will return the value of the telephone number. 
in the second line name will be Chandan, so Chandan and the corresponding telephone number and so on. So, in this way I can print the name and telephone number pairs of all the persons whose names are there in the directory. Okay. Now, let us look at another very important feature of the Perl language namely subroutines. Now, you all know why we use subroutines. Subroutines are used as a user defined function. Its main motivation of usage is to allow code reuse. Code reuse means I write the subroutine once, but I can call it or use it multiple number of times. So, it makes the effort on the purpose of the code designer easier, it also makes the program code shorter. Instead of writing the same function several times, I write it only once and I call it multiple number of times. Let us see in Perl how we can define a subroutine. Define a subroutine is easy, it starts with a keyword sub. So, any subroutine must, must start with this keyword followed by the name of the subroutine, then an opening curly brace, ending curly brace. So, whatever comes in between will be the body of the subroutine. Okay. This is how we define a subroutine. Now, the subroutine can be defined in any place in a given program, but when you are trying to call it normally we use this ampersand prefix to call a subroutine. For example, in this example in this case test underscore sub was the name of the subroutine. When you call it we give an ampersand before it ampersand test sub. A subroutine can also have parameters we will see how parameters can be specified. For example, the second case this is maybe a, a subroutine which computes the GCD of two numbers val 1 and val 2 and this ampersand GCD means that this is a function, but Perl says that this ampersand is optional. If you do not use ampersand test sub or GCD will be by default taken to be the name of a subroutine. So, this ampersand is not a mandatory thing to use you may use it you may not use it. Now, subroutine like in any other language computes something and it can return some value. Again in Perl the return statement is optional. If return is present then the return statement will tell you that what are the values that are being returned just like the return statement in the language C. However, if the return statement is omitted, what Perl assumes is that the last value that was evaluated that by default will be returned. So, the subroutine will be returning the last value that was evaluated. Now, unlike other languages a subroutine can return a non scalar also like it can return in general an array, it can return a list which normally other languages do not support. In C you can return a pointer, but you cannot return a whole list. Okay. Some examples we shall see, this is a very simple example. This is the main part, this is one subroutine this is another subroutine. In the main part we have defined a variable called name, we have called a subroutine welcome, you just, just uh, see that we have not given that dollar, then we have called welcome name, exit means end, so the program ends here. When welcome is called if you look at this particular routine, it simply prints a line hi there, okay, that is all. But the second function welcome name, name i, it should be name or not no i is there. So, here it is printing hi the value of this dollar name. Now, you recall this dollar name is a variable which was defined here, 
So, this is termed as the global variable, a variable which is defined outside the definition of a subroutine and just like any other language like C, if a variable is defined outside a function, it is accessible inside the function unless of course, you redefine another variable with the same name inside it. So, in this way you can access global variables. The second example, here there is a subroutine, this returns a non-scalar. Well, this does not carry out any computation just for the sake of illustration, it returns a pair of values. A pair of values within bracket constitutes a list dollar alpha dollar beta and this is the main function. So, this example tells you one thing that a subroutine can also be defined before the main function, there is no particular ordering. And here we are assigning 15 to alpha, 25 to beta, then we are calling this function. Here alpha and beta will be treated as a global variable again, because these are defined outside the definition of the subroutine before this function is called. So, it will be returning alpha and beta which means 15 and 25. So, this list will be assigned to an array C. So, C will finally, be a list with two elements, the first element will be 15, the second element will be 25. Okay. Okay. So far, we have taken example where there are no arguments to be passed. Now, let us see that how we can pass arguments to a subroutine in Perl. Now, Perl makes it very flexible. Perl assumes that there is a special array called at the rate underscore. This is a special array which contains a number of elements and these elements are considered to be the arguments. So, since this ampersand underscore does not have any name ampersand underscore, so the individual arguments can be accessed as dollar underscore 0, dollar underscore 1, dollar underscore 2 and so on or you can copy the contents of an array to some other list and you can access the elements of that other list also. It, it, uh, it really does not matter, you can use it in any, way in, in any way you can. The only thing you have to remember is that arguments are passed through the array at the rate underscore. You can take the argument list as the entire array or if you want to access the individual arguments, you can also access it as dollar underscore 0, dollar underscore 1 and so on like this. Okay. Fine. Let us take an example. Suppose we are trying to add two numbers, here we are showing it in two different ways. The first is like this, there is a subroutine which is actually adding two numbers as I said. So, here when the subroutine is called the parameter which was there in at the rate underscore this array is assigned to a list. So, the first element will go to dollar first, the second element will go to dollar second. The subroutine then returns dollar first plus dollar second, their sum. Okay. This is the second version, second version does not access the elements from the array at the rate underscore, but it directly access it, it as dollar underscore 0 and dollar underscore 1 and adds them up. So, basically dollar underscore 0 and 1 are the first two elements of at the rate underscore. So, in these ways you can access the individual elements. Let us take another example, where we want to write a generic function called find total that will compute the total of a list of elements within parameter you can specify a list of elements. Now, one thing you understand that in a language like C, whenever you pass a parameter, you cannot give unconstrained number of 
parameters when you are calling it. When you are defining the function, you specify that there will be two parameters or four or five whatever. When you call it, you will have to specify the same number of parameters, but in Perl, you can make it flexible. It is not fixed by definition. Like you see, when I am calling the function, I am calling it in this way. Here within bracket, I have specified five different values, 5, 10, minus 12, 7, 40. So, when the function gets called, these five different values get stored automatically in an array whose name will be at the rate underscore. This means that we are not explicitly assigning the values to the array at the rate underscore, it gets assigned automatically when the array is called. We call the array in the conventional form, within bracket we specify the arguments. Okay. So, within the subroutine, we define a variable called sum initialized to 0 for there is a for loop within bracket we are taking one element of this list at a time we are storing it in num and within the loop we are adding this num to sum so finally all the elements will get added and outside loop we return the value of the sum okay this is a simple example now, in Perl by default, all the variables that you define are global variables. If it is defined outside a subroutine, it can be accessed inside the subroutine also. But sometimes you may define some variable as local, which means that it is only defined or accessible within the scope of that particular subroutine or function. Outside that, it does not have any meaning or value. This can be specified using the my keyword. And wherever you define a local variable using my, the definition is confined to a particular region of code, which is typically a block. Okay. So, as I said, all variables by in, in Perl is by default global, and whenever you go out of the scope, the variable is available no more. So, a small example, the same example as I had given earlier, similar to that, uh, say in the main function, I have assigned a, a number 7 to a variable sum, then I am calling a function add any with 3 parameters 20, 10 and minus 15. So, in the body of the subroutine, I am defining another variable with the same name dollar sum, but I am specifying it with the keyword my, which means that this particular dollar sum is local to this subroutine. This is not accessible or available outside. So, inside when I compute the sum of the elements in this loop, it is this local dollar sum which gets affected and it is returned. So, after return the value of this total, this will be 15, the sum of these three numbers but this original sum will remain at 7, okay. this will not change. Okay. Now, let us see that how we can write some CGI script programs in Perl. Now, we had said before that Perl is a language which has very strong string handling capabilities, this we have already seen. There are some very unique and very strong features of Perl with which you can do some very interesting thing on strings using very few number of statements. These features of Perl gives us a big advantage when you are trying to develop some applications like CGI script, which is essentially a string handling application. Now, we shall be looking at two things, first we shall see how a typical CGI script can be written, second we will see that Perl comes by default whenever you are downloading Perl from some site from, from the internet, it will come not only along with the basic features, but also along with some standard libraries. There are some standard library functions which makes it very easy for the programmer to develop such applications. So, we will see some such application and usage of such standard library. Okay. So, as we had said Perl provides with a number of facilities for writing CGI scripts. 
and there are a number of standard library modules which are included as part of the Perl distribution. You get it automatically whenever you download and install Perl on your machine. There is no need to install them separately. Just an example, there is a very popular standard library called CGI.PM. The libraries are marked as pm. So, when you give cgi dot pm, uh, when you call it, you just write cgi dot pm, you do not specify qw colon standard means you are trying to take it from the standard input. This array, this will be taken as the input to the cgi program and it will be executing. So, we will see actually how these are accessed later. So, as I said, CGI PM is the standard CGI function which is used specifically for writing CGI scripts. In exactly the similar way, there are other Perl libraries which are meant for some other applications. Like there is a set of uh, libraries available in Perl for database interfaces and applications, similarly for socket programming and so on. Well, some of the important functions that are available are, there is a function called header. If you simply call header, this will automatically generate a standard MIME encapsulated HTML header as output. Typically, this will print out the contents type header and if you do not specify anything, by default content type will be text HTML. So, it simply prints out contents type colon text html. So, that so that whatever is now going to generate it, it will be an html file that initial thing has been set up. Similarly, there is a function called start html. Start html print outs the initial tags like html head, title, body, the beginning tags it can accept some optional arguments. For example, it can take an argument specifying that what should be the color of my background, what should be title of my page, because all these tags are generated by this. Now, these will not be empty tags in general, you can also specify the value of some parameters of these tags. Okay. This is start html. Similarly, you can have end html where the end of or the closing html tags, this end body and html, these are printed. Now, some typical usages of these we shall illustrate through some examples. Let us take one very simple example here. Now, this is a CGI script but this CGI script does not accept any data from a form. What it does is that whenever someone invokes the CGI script, this invocation may be through the submission of a form, but the CGI script does not read any data that is coming, but rather it simply prints out some information and returns it back to the requesting client. Let us see what it does. It starts with this initial header user bin Perl. It basically it makes a block print. This two end is the special delimiter it is used. So whatever is there between the delimiters is printed as it is. Content type text HTML. Then the headers HTML head server details body. In the server name. Here we are calling a function $env. $env will invoke or it will return the value of the environment variable whose value is there in the parameter server name. So, whatever is the value of the server name will be printed here. The second one this will print the server port and the third one will print the 
server protocol. So, actually what it will print then? You know that in the in the client server scenario if you recall whenever there is a there is a server that someone is sending some requests to the server there will be a port number at the connecting point which will be set up which will be different for all incoming connections. And suppose I have made a connection and the number that is assigned to me is 2005. So, when I try to print out this port number by using this dollar n server port I will get this 2005 out here. Okay. So, that I know sitting at my client that I have connected to the server all right, but which was the port number that was used. Okay. So, so, this is a very simple CGI script which basically sends out these information to the requesting client every time a block is uh, or means a form is submitted. Okay. Let us take another example. This is basically the same example. You see the previous example. This simply printed some server detail within HTML tags. Here, it is similar in the sense that this also prints a very simple HTML page. Let us see what it prints. First, we are giving this user bin pearl. This WT are some optional flags you can use. The second line actually tells you that you are specifying or you are you are wanting to use the CGI.pm standard library. The first line it uses the function header print header within bracket text.html. So, actually this will generate a mime type header content type text.html. If it is something else you are generating instead of text.html you can write that. If it is image slash jpg you will write image slash jpg. Okay. Then print start html. Start html will be printing the starting tags html, head, title. If you have an optional parameter the first parameter here will indicate the value of the title. So, within the title you can specify the value. Okay. So, this hello world will appear as the title of the page and whatever comes after that this is the actual body of the HTML document okay. and finally, you print the closing lines the end body and HTML these lines. So, you see that writing a simple CGI script is very simple if you are using cgi.pm because you do not have to write lines as in the previous example html head, title head, body these are routine things these routine things are eliminated here. Okay. You can use some standard function calls and the standard function calls will automatically generate these routine things for you. Okay. Fine. Now, let us take an example where a CGI script is used in the proper context, where we have some form data which is coming to us. Now, before trying to understand or, or explain this example, let us uh, very quickly recapitulate how form data come to a CGI script. Just imagine you are a CGI script and some form data is being submitted to you. First thing you will check that whether the submit method or the request method is get or post. If it is get you recall then the data is available in a in an environment variable called query string. If it is post then it is available as a continuous stream which is coming from the standard input and the content length environment variable will tell you that how many bytes are there total in that string. Okay. So, this particular CGI program will try to check that and will act accordingly which means that irrespective of whether you are submitting the data through get or post this script will work both ways. Next let us try to understand once the data comes suppose you have selected the proper mode get or post and the data is coming to you. 
you remember the data are coming as name and value pairs name 1 equal to value 1 ampersand name 2 equal to value 2 ampersand name 3 equal to value 3 and so on. So, you have to do two things first you have to cut the strings at the ampersand points and extract the name value pairs name 1 equal to value 1 will be one such name 2 equal to value 2 will be another such. Once you have these pairs you cut at the equal sign now. So, now you have the list name and value. So, these are the basic steps you need to follow to actually extract the data that is coming to you individually in terms of elements element by element. Now, let us see how this works out here. Here we have written this in the form of a subroutine. This is a very standard kind of a thing which is required for almost all form data submission that is why we have written it in the form of a subroutine. The name of a subroutine we have given is, is parse form data. Here we have defined an associative array called form data. Now, why associative array you can understand because data is coming as name and value pairs. So, very naturally there is a pair concept here name will be the hash key and value will be the value and there is a variable called name value. Okay. In this statement by default we are assuming that the request method is get and the data is available in the query string. If you call the function dollar env with parameter as the query string then the whole query string will be coming here as a single string. If you call the function split with delimiter ampersand then the query string will be broken up into a number of smaller strings each will be like name 1 equal to value 1 that will be one string name 2 equal to value 2 will be another string and so on and these individual elements will be stored in an array these are calling nv pairs name value pairs. So, nv pairs will contain each element will contain a string which is of the form name 1 equal to value 1 like this. Okay. This is if it is the get method. Now, after that I check that if the environment request method if the request method environment variable its value is equal to post or not if it is not post which means it is get which have already done whatever is to be done we skip this body of the if statement. But if it is post then we do something ok. There is a query variable which you initialize it to null there is a function in Perl called read which reads from file as you know it reads from standard input because in post you have to read from standard input after reading we will be storing the string in query and for how many bytes the third parameter tells you how many bytes content length so many bytes. So, it continuously reads so many bytes and the total thing will get stored into the variable query dollar query. Now, the dollar query contains the entire string now. Now, just like we had split the query string to get the NV pairs here we do the same thing we split the query variable into NV pairs, but here we use the push function. You could have used a simple assignment also it does not make any difference, but this is how we do it. After that see so this NV pairs if you look back this NV pairs will contain some elements name 1 equal to value 1 name 2 equal to value 2 like that. Now, for each name value belonging to this array you now split with respect to equal to this each of the string you get name 1 equal to value 1 on that you split and you store it in two variables name and value. Now, these four lines are very standard I am not trying to go into the detail explaining it basically the idea is that you know that when you are doing 
this URL encoding then sometimes spaces are encoded as plus. So, wherever there is a plus you translate it into space. So, this line and this line does this and the second and the fourth line actually decodes the encoded values because you know some special characters are hex encoded. So, wherever there are hex encoded characters you replace the hex encoded characters by the corresponding character value. This chr hex this is a function call which converts the hexadecimal equivalent of this into its corresponding ASCII code. So, you do this for the name as well as to the value part and in the form data name form data is an associative array. So, there in the name part you store value and you return it finally. So, actually what this subroutine is doing is that it is extracting the form data and all the name value pairs taken together it is storing it in an associative array and the associative array after that you can use in whatever way you want. Uh, CJ.PM as I said that there are some special facilities which are available to you. There is a function param which if you call with as a argument the field name you get the value directly. You do not have to do this routine splitting and all these things together. These are already being taken care of in the function param. So, an equivalent Perl code of whatever was done here, okay, this big function an equivalent Perl code using cj.pm is here just this much. You define an associative array for each name belonging to param you store form data name the value of param s name. This will do equivalently the same thing which means if you are accessing routinely form data you need not have to write the program code for that. There are some functions param uh, here for example, which is already available to you which you can use directly and extract the value corresponding to the name and all this splitting and searching all this thing will be taken care of automatically within the function. This is already being provided to you. Okay. Now, another quick example, an example for sending mail. You see here we are printing the header of the HTML, printing start HTML, this is the title, environment path, this is optional, do not require. You open, this is a pipe, you open mail, this is a pipe, this is how you use it. So, whenever you call send mail, whatever is coming to you that will be sent as a pipe, as a stream of characters to the send mail program. These are some flags to the send mail. I am not going to detail of this. There is a variable recipient, some standard things you are printing to this to the file handler called main to, from, subject, all these things. Then for each value in the param, you print xyz equal to this. So, the entire thing, whatever is coming, I want to send as a mail the name and value pairs. Okay. So, thanks for the comments, hope you visit again. This is end, this by verbose using this um end of file marker we just print it. So, actually what you do, we actually this is like a guest book, whenever means uh, wherever there is a guest book, someone is uh, specifying that well this is my name, this is my email address and this is my comment. So, whenever that guest book is submitted, what I get back as email is that who had sent it, what is his name and what is his comment. This is what I will get back as mail. So, in CJ as you can see that this is very simple to do. Okay. So, with this we come to the end of uh, today's lecture. So, let us quickly see the solutions to the questions that we posed in our last lecture. Show an example illustrating the split function. Well this we had also illustrated today. Given an array we can call split by specifying a delimiter. Write a Perl code segment to join three strings a, b and c separated by a delimiter this. Simply using join you specify the delimiter and then this step is not required here in this case you can specify the three uh, strings a, b and c. What is the difference between equal to tilde and 
exclamation tilde the first one means pattern is present this means pattern is not present this uh, you use for string match is it possible to change the forward slash delimiter if so how we use it by specifying this m like if you want to change to this at the rate we use this m m followed by the letter and this will be the last letter also write Perl code segment to search for the presence of a vowel and a consonant in a given string. If it is vowel your code will be like this string matches a e i o u. If it is consonant you will write like this it is a not a e i o u ok. Well assuming that it is only alphabetic character. How do I specify a regular expression indicating a word preceding and following a space and starting with b ending with d with the letter a somewhere in between you see this regular expression it starts with a space ends with a space after that is it there is b is the first letter d is the last letter there is a somewhere in between this star means any number of characters in between zero or more okay so this is what is the specification write a parl command to replace all occurrences of the string bad to good in a string substitute bad by good global means all if you do not write g then only the first occurrence will get replaced write a Perl code segment to replace all occurrence of string bad to good in a given file it is similar you open two files input and output and while this input is not empty is coming you substitute the lines line by line then you print in the output file dollar underscore then close the files. Write a Perl command to exchange the first two words starting with a vowel in a given character string. This is a vowel corresponding after that anything a space that means word boundary another vowel a space you interchange them like this. What are the meaning of the variable this three? First one means pre match, present match and post match. Then uh, some questions from today's lecture. How do you specify an associative array using the equal to greater than operator? How can you convert a normal array to an associative array? How can you delete a hash key value pair from an associative array? How are arguments passed to subroutines? What is the significance of my variables in a Perl subroutine? With the help of an example illustrate how the cgi.pm library can be used to create CJ script programs. Uh, so, with this we come to the end of today's lecture. In our next lecture we will be starting our discussion on JavaScript, what it is and how it can be used to develop web pages. Thank you.